Well, hello, everybody. Yes, another edition of Zoom Landlord Tenant Talk Radio coming at you every Saturday at 3 p.m. until I faint. But uh, appreciate everybody uh, joining us today. Uh, if you were curious as to that song I was playing, it was by Bill Medley and Jennifer Wands. It was the song called Time of My Life. And of course, it was the soundtrack from a movie called Dirty Dancing, which was a very popular movie. In any event, uh, I always open this up with uh, a little discussion on a topic of law. And today, I want to talk about the um, emotional support animals, probably one of the most abused topics uh, that uh, the government has foisted upon us in the state of California where landlords who have a no pet policy for some very legitimate business reasons are now forced to have pets, uh, whether their policy of the building uh, prohibits it or not. Of course, this is opening up uh, landlords to lawsuits by tenants and uh, visitors that get bitten by them. Also, sometimes the mess that the pet owners refuse to clean up. And yet uh, a tenant who's moving into your building uh, and states no pets, I don't have any pets. And as soon as the ink is dry on the rental agreement, all of a sudden they're moving in with their big Great Dane and they're handing you some documentation that this is an emotional support animal. And there's very little that uh, landlords can do to prevent this. However, in January of the year 2022, the state of California did tighten it up a little bit with regard to what constitutes an emotional support animal. So I wanna go back and uh, share the requirements now. So bear with me. And as you can see right now, these are the requirements that the state of California re uh, states that a tenant must provide in order to have the right to have an emotional support animal. Now, if you have one of these certificates that state that a uh, Fido is an emotional support animal and they have a little picture of the uh, dog and smiling face and they have the dog's name on it and it's coming from Oklahoma, the certificate, that is not in any way in compliance with the law. So let's go over what you need to be in compliance with the law. Number one, the uh, this has to be a written letter by a health professional who must hold a legitimate and active license in the state of California. It has to include their license number and the effective date and what jurisdiction they're in. So if, in fact, they don't include any of these items, then that would not give rise to the tenant uh, right to have an emotional support animal. Also, in terms of their license, it has to be in the scope of which they're going to be issuing this emotional support um, letter stating that the tenant does have a disability and requires uh, the use of an emotional support animal. So, for example, if I'm a foot doctor and I'm giving this, uh, uh, with all due respect to podiatrists, of course, but if I'm giving a... Um, uh, emotional support letter, uh, that's not within the confines of my license. Also, it states that the letter must indicate that the tenant was treating with this medical professional at least 30 days prior to the issuance of this letter. And of course, this health professional must conduct a clinical evaluation as to the reasons why they need an emotional support animal. So if they come on in, ladies and gentlemen, with a uh, just a certificate that FIDO is a emotional support animal, you can tell the tenant that they're not in compliance with the law and that you will be uh, moving forward to deny their right to have that tenant uh, bring in a dog. Uh, even if, ladies and gentlemen, that they have a dog that is truly an emotional support animal. They they brought the um, they brought you the proper documentation. And then of course the tenant goes to work 
and every second that the tenant's in work, they will uh, the dog will be barking and making misery for everybody else until the tenant arrives home. Uh, in that situation, even with the proper documentation, you have the right to tell the tenant, look, I'm in, I, you are entitled to a reasonable accommodation because of your disability to have an emotional support animal. But if this is not a reasonable and I'm getting complaints from everybody, then while I'm going to tell you, if you can't solve this situation by not creating a nuisance for other tenants, that I'm going to tell you that this dog must go. I'm not telling you that you can't have an emotional support animal. I'm telling you that this one can't be in my property. So keep that in mind that even with this documentation, if the dog is creating a problem, you have the right to tell that tenant to get rid of it or the tenant will face uh, an eviction. Okay, so let's open it up to uh, our wonderful audience that I see is very strong right now. And I do appreciate that, that it keeps growing and growing. Remember some of the ground rules with regard to uh, discussing is please wait till you're called upon. Uh, you can electronically raise your hand so that I know you wanna ask a question. Uh, and also, please try to keep your questions short and concise because we have a lot of people and we want to make sure that everybody's questions get answered. Uh, also, if this is, if you're referring to a specific case with my firm, uh, I'm going to ask you not to discuss that. This case, this seminar is really, or forum is really open for general questions on law. And while we're talking about general questions on law, the everything you hear today is for informational purposes only. It's not a substitute for getting quality legal help. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to kick it off today on March 30th uh, for our asking of the questions. We're going to turn our attentions first to Dina. I'm going to ask Dina if you'd be so kind as to unmute yourself. Yes, Dennis. Hi, how are you? And thank you so much again for sharing your wisdom. I'm going to jump on my question. Um, you know, uh, in the uh, lease agreement with the tenant, um, there is, a, a, you know, a clause or a provision. It says here that a negative credit reflecting on tenant's record may be submitted to a credit reporting agency if tenant fails to fulfill the terms of payment and other obligation under this agreement. Now the tenant has vacated the unit and I send them everything properly with the final uh, you know, itemization form and they don't wanna pay. Can I report them to a, a agency or I have to have to go to small court to have a judgment first or no, you can, you can do both. You can uh, obviously report them to a credit agency in, in that they vacated the premises owing you money. That's certainly permissible. Okay. Uh, and even if that clause wasn't in your contract, that certainly is permissible. Okay. Secondly, you can sue them in small claims court. The jurisdictional limit now for an individual is $12,500. I think for uh, a an entity like an LLC, I think it's $6,500. But then if they owe me like a little bit over 1,000, I still can go uh, a small court, but I wanna go to the credit and and try it with them because it's less hassle. That's what I'm, I'm heading for. Well, reporting them to the credit institution is not necessarily gonna get you paid. Yeah. <laughs> So, but but it certainly but will warn other landlords that uh, this person is a bad credit risk. Right, and only one question in this regard, uh, uh, Dennis. Uh, you know, if uh, if I want to do that, is it okay? Because it's had been three months. Is it okay to let them know, like, hey, if you're not going, you know, to pay me, I might report you to a credit. Is that okay? I don't see any problem with that, that, oh, okay. that the tenant is going to have his credit uh, impaired based on the fact that he owes you money and doesn't want to pay you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dennis. Appreciate it as usual. All right. You take care. Thank All you. All right. Let's move on to Dean. Dean, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Yes, I'm unmuted now. Hey, Dean, how are you? <laughs> Good. Um, thank you very much for having this uh, webinar. It's cool. Um so this is my first time here. Um, I, so I'm I'm working with a real estate agent who's in Whittier, California, 
And uh, we were trying to buy a uh, income property for me, um, a, a duplex or maybe a triplex or maybe even four units. Um, and we've, um, so we, we initially um, tried for Montebello uh, because I think that it's got somewhat of a lax, um, um, what do you call it? Um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Um, they don't rent have control. rent control, right? Uh, yeah, rent rent control. So so we were um, we we're focusing on Montebello, but then this property came up in L.A. City 90090016 on Lucerne Avenue, and it you know it looks good, um, and I was considering um, uh, occupying one of the two units, and the two units are twelve hundred something and eighteen hundred something the rents. So I'm I'm saying, I'm asking, if I moved in to one of the units, could I kick out the guy that's paying the lower rent, the 1200 whatever, and and then live there? Um, okay, well, let's first to go over the first issue. Uh, I just looked it up on my chart. There are so many cities uh, and rent control, as I've stated in the past, is like a cancer. It keeps growing. Montebello does have rent control. Uh, it's under the city of Montebello housing, uh, oh. and, uh, you'd have to check their statute as to how much you could raise the rent. If it's not subject to Montebello rent control, then you're subject to statewide rent control, but let's move on to your, uh, issue dealing with this property. I think you said on Lucerne in the city of Los Angeles, right? Uh, this is a duplex. It's a duplex. It's right. It's right South of the 10 freeway. You can like see the freeway from it, but. Well, so that's where it is. Don't say anything. People will be racing to buy it from out. From <laughs> oh, but yeah, you're right. Okay. The, anyway, uh, it's not. It's it, they in, both have the same amount of bedrooms. Let's, uh, they're both one bedroom, one bath. Okay. So here's the deal. Number one, if any tenant has lived there longer than 10 years and is over the age of 62, for the city of Los Angeles, you are not, they are exempt from being evicted to put in yourself or a family member. Once again, oh, wow. if they've lived there longer than 10 years and are over 62. Now, is that, other, a, is that an and or an or? It's and. It has, to be, both both. Of, has to be both of those. Okay. The second thing is, is they have a rule in, in the city of Los Angeles rent control ordinance is last in, first out. So you got to oh. take the last tenant, which generally means is the one who's paying the highest rent. Right. Okay, and then and then in general, does the um, in, in the city of LA does the rent control change at all by the fact that the place is owner occupied or one of the two units is owner? -occupied? No, it doesn't have any effect. Uh, the tenants have just as much protection, or whether you own the property and you're owner occupied or not. Okay, I think that answers my questions. Well, thank uh, you, much, Gene. Ap much appreciated. Nice joining us. Okay, let's move over to, uh, let's see here. I'm going to pick on Fred. Fred, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself if you'd be so kind. Yeah. Hi, Fred. Hi, Dennis. How are you? Good. I have two questions, and I'm going to try to make it as quick as possible. I purchased, I'm an investor, purchased the property, closed uh, last Friday, yesterday. And I purchased it through REO with the occupant in the property. Uh, as of today in the morning, I found out that actually the previous owner, the previous, the bank did file an eviction. And there, on Wednesday of this week, there is a sheriff lockout. Now, I don't know if the asset manager already put a stop on the sheriff lockout or not. But my question is now as a new owner, can I proceed with that or how can I get sheriff being there on Wednesday and get them out? First of all, the sheriff's not going to be there on Wednesday. What you're talking about is that there was a notice to vacate placed on the tenant store, I'm guessing, that said you got to be out in five days. So I think you're reading that and assuming that the tenant, the sheriff will be there on the sixth day. Am I correct? No, I do have confirmation knowing that Sheriff would go there on Wednesday at okay. 11 o'clock. Okay, then you actually have an absolute lockout date. 
Uh, technically, how this should work is that the um, the bank should still go forward with this with your permission. So in other words, you give permission to the asset manager of the bank saying, I'm acting now as, uh, I'm appointing you now as property supervisor for me, the new owner of the property to continue on with the eviction. Hopefully they'll do that. But as a practical matter, my friend, based, based on what I'm seeing out there, I would just show up. If you have any paperwork showing that the, what the time is on that date and time, have that in your hand and just say, I'm the agent and we're ready to change the locks and see what happens. So you, you're telling me, Dennis, that there's no way that the asset manager could have stopped uh, for Sheriff showing Oh, up. the asset manager definitely could have stopped it. You okay. know, you might so, want to go online to the Sheriff's website and you can punch it in uh, the your case number, which you should have for that, yes. that action and the tenant's last name. And then if you scroll over to where it says the tab, it says, I think it's service then um, you'll see if it's been canceled, okay? Well, it does show that on the 16th, they did the five days notice, but- Well, they might have canceled I... it since then. And you know what? If, if And this might be boring for everybody else, but do you have the case number handy? Yes, I do. What is it? Uh, one second. Got to do it quick, my friend. I know. I actually did email I'll, it to I'll, you. I'll, I'll, have tell you if, I'll tell you Please? if it's- Number three, C as a cat, H as no, a no, no, no. It's got no. It's got to be twenty three, two three. No, no, no. Number three. Okay, that couldn't be. It would have to start with a year. Um. So, uh, what city is this? This is in Granada Hills. Okay. Yeah. No, it would start with a two three. I'm gonna table this right now, my friend. Talk to me at the office, and you know I get there early. Right, okay, thank you, Fred. Okay. Let's move on to, hope I didn't bore everybody with that, but I wanted to see if the sheriff had already canceled the lockout. Uh, I'm going to ask Crystal to unmute yourself. Hello, Crystal. Hi, Dennis. Thanks for hosting this. Um, I have two questions. My first question is um, a fourplex in the city of Los Angeles. It is subject to RSO. Um one tenant has been there over like 20 something years. The rent is like way, way, way below market. I have a vacant unit that I am updating. Um, I was wondering, um, this tenant is section eight. Do you see any harm or would you have any reservations in asking if that tenant would like to move to the upgraded unit? Um, and as a follow-up, I would not have to pay relocation correct if they do decide to move well if they want to move from one unit to the other unit there would be no relocation that would be considered a you know a voluntary vacating of the unit that they're in but i don't know how she's going to do that you'd have to get approval from section eight and obviously you want to get more money for that uh for that unit uh so you'd have to work this through your section eight advisor uh this property is under la rent control i presume Yes, it is. Yeah, you're 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 somewhat stuck. I don't think she could do it unless she's getting off of Section Eight and wants to move to this other unit, and you'll give her a discount off for the market value, so you free up the other apartment. But other than that, I don't see how that would work. So you don't see how they would be able to move into the upgraded unit. Well, how are they going to get? Uh, how is how is Section Eight all of a sudden going to start paying on this other unit? You're going to have to get Section Eight approval. Yeah, I mean, I figured they were already on Section 8. They would just be moving basically next door. I didn't... No, you have to get the Section 8 to approve the new unit. This is a brand new unit and it has to be certified. In any event, I... Crystal, thank you. I'm going to move on. Appreciate you. Let's move on to... Uh... Oh, I missed him. Chris, um, I hit the wrong button. Let me see if I can find you. I think it was Chris Landis. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Are you there? Uh, hey, how you doing? I'm so uh, I have a question about the past due uh, from COVID uh, 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 with uh, with tenants. 
um you know how is it that the tenants are seem to be winning these cases eviction cases and small claims cases against the past due for covid amounts uh i i'm not aware of that so i don't know how many you've seen lose their cases but i'm certainly not aware of that i mean you have the right to proceed forward with a small claims court lawsuit for any of the covid rent at this time Small claims court jurisdiction is um, unlimited for COVID rent. You're not subject to that twelve thousand five hundred dollar figure. But in eviction, but evictions are, seem to be going by the wayside. Uh, maybe if you use a different attorney, certainly not. If you're using my firm, we're we're highly successful uh, in terms of going forward with these types of evictions. Okay, and if one if one of the their defense is, is that, you know, my manager told the tenant that uh, not to, um, that they weren't going to apply uh, for um, assistance themselves. Um, you know, the tenant is saying that it's, it's my responsibility, the management's responsibility to have applied for that assistance as well as the tenant. And that is totally erroneous. That's not the law. So okay, uh, they, can, they can walk in the court and say that. Anyway, thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to uh, Christina Doran. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Christina. There. Can you hear me? I can. Look at you, girl. Uh, I have the renewed uh, RSO certificates that I know I have to post the new one, but I have to mail a copy of it to each tenant. The registration with... certificate, which you're referring to under RSO for Los Angeles. Yes. Okay. That does not have to be posted. It just has to be mailed to each of your tenants. Do I have to add additional documents with that? Well, uh, not what's mailed to the tenant. There are two potentially two for RSO properties, notices that have to be posted. I believe those are on my website. And those have to be posted in a conspicuous spot. One is a notice that your property is subject to RSO. The other one is, is a statement that you, uh, the, the protections that tenants are gonna get. So these are two notices that need to be posted for RSO properties. If it's a non-RSO property, even a single family home, you have to, uh, post the protection notice. Okay. And there's not the notice that's about cash for keys. Is that a notice that needs to be posted? No. no. Okay. Great. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. And we are going to move on to Michael and Sari. Hello, Michael. Say hello. Hello, Dennis. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for your service. Uh, thank you very much also to uh, taking care of that uh, eviction that we had. It was successful and uh, and um, you guys did a great job. So my new question is that uh, we have um, we have another property that, uh, uh, you know, we manage and uh, there is no leases that are signed uh, between them. Um, now, I would like to um, force the tenants, and by the way, you know, they're not giving us any information about how many people live there, the occupants over the 18, or, you know, they're really, uh, you know, uh, not responsive, uh, responsible. Uh, so I'd like to, um, you know, uh, is it possible to enforce them to sign a lease? First of uh, all, what city, please? Uh, that's in uh, North Hollywood. It's uh, So you're under LA rent family. control, correct? It's a single family home. Oh, it's a single family home. Okay, that's much different. And uh, how is it that uh, you're you're now managing the property for the for the owner? Correct. Uh, yeah, the owner passed away a couple of years ago. It went to the son, and uh, you know they never had any leases with any of these tenants. Uh, some have signed some of these uh, tenants, but this is specific ones is not. Uh, you know, All right, right, so I have the I have the answer. Present them with a lease and ask, tell them that I need you to tell me who's living there. And also, I'm going to then complete a lease 
where every adult who's living there must sign the lease. Tell them that if they choose not to, then you're merely going to raise the rent. This is a single family home, only one house on the lot, you can raise the rent. So tell them either I'm gonna give you, cause if, I'm pretty sure you were planning on raising the rent anyway. Either I, I I'm gonna give you, and this is, yeah, I'm, this is just by way of example. I'm either gonna raise your rent $1,200 per month or I'm gonna raise it 800. If you want me to raise it 800, you got to fill out this new rental agreement. Otherwise, I'm going to 1200. But there is no limitation on what you can charge for a single family home. So that's your kind of your you're carrying the big stick there. And you got a carrot and a stick. So depending on whatever you really wanted to raise your rent to, tell them, fill out this rental agreement. I want to know the occupants and I'm only going to raise it to this amount. Otherwise, I'm going to, I don't care who's there. I'm raising your rent an additional 500 over that. So I think that's the way to go. Okay. And if they don't? Well, then you're going to raise the rent to the higher amount. And when they don't pay, then I think you happen to know an attorney who can assist you. Okay. So, uh, so my, can I, can I have your service to take care of this? <laughs> Always my friend, you know, the number. All oh, right. Okay. Thank you so much. And we're going to move on to Kevin Davis. Kevin Davis, say hello. Hey, Dennis. Hi there. Um, I was told that I have to have a physical address within five miles of a property for my tenants to uh, personally deliver the rent if they choose. Is that correct? That is incorrect. You do have to have, you don't have to have a uh, a physical address where rent can be paid. You can do it to a PO box. You can do it to a bank uh, where they make a deposit into your bank account. There is that rule that says that uh, in a three day notice, if you're gonna demand that they pay your bank account, that that bank must be within five miles. That might be where you're getting it. But other than that, you could tell them, hey, I want all my rent mail to you know the state of Washington, Seattle, Washington, you could do that. Okay. All right, very good, thank you. All right, Kevin, thank you. We are moving through these phone calls pretty nicely. Let's move on to Sonia. Sonia, I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself. Yes, hi, Dennis. Hello. Hi, so my question has to do with, um, so if the policy was no pets, but upon move out, it seems like other neighbors and we could see hair throughout the property that there was a pet. My question is, as far as, can we charge extra for the our cleaning fee? Because we have a reasonable cleaning fee, but is it okay to charge a little bit more because we never had pets and we want to do a more thorough cleaning? Okay, first of all, you've got the concept of uh, your cleaning fees uh, incorrect. Uh, you are always allowed to charge, uh, and there can't be a set cleaning fee like $75 or whatever, or $200. It has to be what it actually and reasonably costs you to clean the unit. So if the unit requires more labor to clean it because of, quote, the pet hair, then the cost of the cleaning will go up. But there is no set amount for cleaning. It's what, you, and this is from what you deduct from the security deposit, it's actual reasonable cleaning charges. Okay, great. Thank you. You're very welcome, Sonia. Okay, let's move on to Faraba. Fariba? I don't know, I'm butchering it. How do you pronounce that? Hi, Fariba. Fariba, how are you, darling? Doing well, thank you so much. I um, actually tried to get in touch with you early in the morning and that prompt didn't work. Uh, so on Saturdays, my I do not answer early. Oh, it's thanks. only Monday through Friday. Everybody can get me from seven to eight, but only if you know my secret extension which can only be used between seven to eight, Monday through Friday, and only for the 58 people that are in this room, it is extension 1001, and probably the other 700 people will be listening to this after I put it up on YouTube. But <laughs> 1001, uh, you can call me, I will answer between the hours of seven to eight. I'm there the whole day, but then you have to go through the queue. Uh, so if you do need me, just take advantage of that. But please do not use my extension on a Saturday or a Sunday or any time outside the hours of 7 to 8 a.m. Okay, but the prompt didn't give me the option to do the extension. 
Okay, but you don't need that. So the way you do the extension, as soon as you hear the recording, you hit 1001. Okay, okay you got it. Thank you so much for that. Uh, the reason I'm calling right now is I have a unit that has been abandoned and I uh, he didn't pay rent. We uh, served a three day notice for the cameras. We realized that he's not coming in and out. And actually just last night, we found out that he's been incarcerated and his earliest release date will be another year. I so, would still go through a formal abandonment of real property. That's uh, a form or a letter that you need to send to the tenant's last known address, which is your property. And when he doesn't comply with that, then in 18 days from the mailing of that, that abandonment notice that you'll then be able to legally take possession. Okay, so just uh, change the lock and remove his uh, personal belongings. Do I yes, need that's to... after the 18 days. Right. Do I need to store them? Well, then you're going to need to go through something called abandonment of personal property. You're going to have to send another letter. And depending on uh, how much uh, is is uh, the value of it, you might have to hold an auction or you might have to put it into storage. Was everything removed or everything is still in the unit? No, everything is in the unit. You know what? I might be changing my advice on that as I think about this. I don't know that this qualifies as an abandonment because the tenant was uh, would love to come back. He did abandon the premises voluntarily. It was involuntarily. I think you need to go through a regular eviction case. So to be perfectly legal as opposed to him coming out of jail and saying you didn't go through the process. So I'm not sure that an abandonment would work in that situation. But the fact that he's incarcerated, I won't be able to serve him. Well, number one, you can serve him by serving the property. There's a procedure called an order to post. Unless you know specifically where he's locked up, then we can always go to that jail facility. No, I don't know where he's locked up. Then we would go by way of an order to post. So we would serve a three-day notice by posting and mailing. Once the lawsuit's filed, the process server will attempt to try to serve it for a week. Once he is unable to serve it because the tenant legitimately is not there, we'd apply for something called a order to post. That allows us to serve the tenant by just posting it on the door. It's a procedure we do all the time. So we would get a lawful judgment against him and lawfully be able to change the locks. And how long does that usually take? Probably about three months based on the fact that we'll have to get an order to post. Now, you know, you can take a reasonable chance that the guy's just going to come back get out of jail, say, where's my stuff? Where's my legal process that you didn't go through and I'm going to sue you? Or he just, you know, goes into the woodworks and you never see him again. But I wouldn't take the chance. Okay, I appreciate it. All Thank right, you. take care. Okay, let's move on to, we have Amy N. Amy N, come on down by unmuting. Hello, thank you again for this, Dennis. Um, I have a question with the balcony inspection, um, the SB 326. Does it apply to townhomes as well? If there's like a three unit townhome in Redondo well, ta Beach? Townhomes, uh, I don't think it applies to townhomes. I think it, and I have to go back and take a look at the law. I know it's not really effective. I don't think until 2025. Correct, correct. So yeah. uh, I haven't really looked at it yet. Uh, okay. you know, I'll dust it off, but I think it only applies to multi-units, uh, not a townhouse, condo, or a single-family residence. And okay. what they're talking about, ladies and gentlemen, is another boondoggle by the state of California saying that if you have a building with, with a balcony or staircases, that you have to get it certified by a certified balcony staircase contractor who's going to state that he's inspected it and everything was fine with it. It's just another way of stealing money from you that you're going to have to go through these inspections. They yeah. should have inspected that bridge that that boat hit, but that's mm -hmm. another story. Thanks, Dennis. All right. Take care. Uh, let's move on to SoCal Lillian. How are you, Lillian? Say hello. Hi, Dennis. Can you hear me? I can. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dennis, for doing this. And I had the honor to meet you at the AOA uh, conference last week. Oh, thank you. Yes. Had a, had a good time there. Yes, yes. Um, but what's what's so crowded? Your summer is like packed. <laughs> well, I'm uh <laughs> we're kind of busy, but yeah, I yeah. uh I gave the speech there that uh, a lot of people were waiting to hear. So 
Yes, because you're like you're like a celebrity. That's why. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. So I have two multi-unit properties in Los Angeles City, the city of Los Angeles. One's Sorry about that. I know one is R under RSO and the other is not. So my question is about utilities. So I've been covering the cost of utilities for most of units previously, uh, because there's not enough separate uh, electric and um, electricity and gas meter for each unit. And of course, that's one water meter per property. So my question is, can I start charging for gas, electricity, and water? And if oh. so, what is a proper way to do it? Okay, first of all, there's only one meter for electricity and one meter for gas for the entire building? Uh, no, actually, um, there's one or two units have one uh, that share meter. So for example, I have one that's five unit and there's like four, there's five units, but then uh, yeah, there's some units that share. Okay, well, number one, you can't do anything for I, any of those people because number one, you're under LA rent control or you're under statewide rent control. And now you're asking them to basically pay more money, uh, which is like a, an indirect increase in the rent if you're going to now ask them to pay for utilities that they weren't already paying. If <clears throat> new tenants coming in, of course you could have them pay for their utilities. If they're on a shared utility, then you're gonna to have to have uh, something in the rental agreement stating that uh, there is a shared utility meter <clears throat> between these two units and that you will be required to pay 50% of the bill. <clears throat> or you can do hire a company that would do rubs, that's the ratio utility uh, billing system, which basically uh, estimates the use of the water and, and uh, power and gas. So that's uh, for new tenants coming in only. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, all right. So, all right. So I, then Dennis, my second question, hopefully this is fast. I have, I'm planning to buy a eight unit in Whittier. I understand that in Whittier, some parts is under the California state law and some are, un, are like, a, they call it unincorporated unincorporated area. So what is the sure way to find out this address, whether it's in the city of Whittier or the unincorporated? Because that's very important in terms of like the tenant's right and the tenant's law and eviction. You have to go to, and I'm looking at it right now, it's the Los Angeles County Register Recorder. And so look that up, Los Angeles County Register Recorder. They're going to bring you to a web page where there's a drop down menu that says district map lookup. And you're going to add in your, the address of the property on the street. It will tell you whether it's the city of Whittier or unincorporated areas of Whittier. So, which means if it's unincorporated, it falls under the harsh rent control statute of LA County. Got you. Okay. All right. Got it. Thank you so much, Dennis. Really appreciate it. No problem. Uh, bear with me. Okay. Let's move on to Missy. Missy, I'm going to ask you. Missy, yeah, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Yes. You hello, go. Dennis. Thank hello. you. Yes. Thank you for this forum. And I'm a member of your uh, concierge service. So thank you for answering my calls. Um, so, um, RSO, uh, Triplex, LA City, and uh, I filed for notice to evict for family occupancy, and um, I'm under mom and pop guidelines from what I read. However, the tenant bamboozled me and said that, uh, you know, put in the, to this LA housing that there's a senior 62 plus living there. So I obviously appealed. So I'm getting ready to do that. However, my question is, if the LA housing um, uh, goes with the side of the tenant because everything right now is, you know, tenant uh, rights. Can I, and later, if I decide to do so much later, do a, uh, I would call that small claims for breach of contract because the, the supposedly mom, you know, is not on the lease, but yet he threw that in there in the LA housing to uh, determine uh, well, if if it doesn't work out, then what I would do 
is start an eviction on an unauthorized occupant. You never authorized her to live there. Uh, no, but they did already vacate. Oh, they're already out? Well, what would you be suing in small claims court for? No, in the event that uh, the hearing that I am appealing for, because under mom yeah. and pop, I should I be understand, doesn't work out. So now you have to pay additional uh, relocation because their status is higher. But what would you be suing them for in small claims court? Well, for uh, uh, fraud and breach of contract. But there isn't fraud. There's been an administrative determination that there wasn't fraud. Because the L.A. Housing Department uh, blessed the fact that this was a proper occupant of the unit. Okay, even though they were never in the lease agreement? I I'm in agreement with you, which is I, I think we have to first wait, because you're just assuming you're going to lose this appeal. Uh, I think the we first have to wait to see what, what they do and then make a determination thereafter. I see. Okay. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll be calling your office uh, again. I appreciate, appreciate that. And now we're going to move on to Greg. Greg, I'm going to ask you to lower your hand or unmute yourself, please. Hey, Dennis, how are you? I'm um, good. I have a question. Uh, I have a I have a property that um, is uh, a fourplex, but there was kind of a, an illegal dwelling and like kind of basement area that the prior owner um, got busted for. It's in the city of uh, El Segundo. Mm -hmm. um, and the city said that no one could live there. Um, so they made them take out the kitchen and there's no kitchen there but um we actually fixed it up and um wanted to kind of rent out as an additional living space because it's directly underneath another existing legal unit that's now vacant and i wanted to kind of rent that space out in addition to um you know the the, the legal unit and add this uh illegal space as a living space but not obviously a separate unit is that something that would be illegal for me to do i don't i don't you know, think so if you're renting it <laughs> to a tenant who's already in the building and you're just saying hey this is like an extra rec room or something uh mm -hmm. then i don't see yeah i don't see that as a problem because you're not putting in a kitchen or or a bathroom in there without a permit obviously and you're oh, just there, there is a there is a bathroom uh, but there's no kitchen OK, so as long as he doesn't change the configuration, because that's a mm -hmm. that's a legal space. And as long as you're not trying to rent it out separately. So you might want to go up on the rent, and say, hey, if you want this additional space, then this is what it's going to cost. But it's all but it has to be tied to a legal unit in the property. Would I do like as two separate um, like say this is like an op rental, like it's an office space and the other one would be a, uh, like a living space lease or would I just do one lease for both spaces? Uh, I'd probably do one lease for both spaces uh, Okay, would be the way I would do it. Could you do it as a separate office lease only commercial? I guess you could. I don't see a problem with that. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Moving along. We're going to move over to Al. Al, how are you? How are you? Hi, hi Dennis. Hello. I've been hearing a lot about squatters recently. And I, I yeah, like I, it. Me too. Me too. <laughs> you too. You've had um, squatter cases? Uh, well, yeah, we've had these back since the 80s where somebody breaks into a unit and then... Uh, produces a phony lease to the police department and then uh, refuses uh, to get out. And the police say, look, I don't know who's telling the truth. So this is a civil matter. So those types of evictions are not unlawful detainers. They're considered forcible detainers. We do that all the time. However, this seems to be running rampant. Uh, my accountant, um, Bruce Bialowski, is actually going to be interviewing me because uh, he does a town hall column that's uh, nationally read. Uh, he was going to be interviewing me on this topic. In fact, he might even be listening to us now. But the um, it has been running rampant. Uh, we saw cases in New York. The the ones the only state that has it together that I know of was Florida. Just passed a rule that said if somebody breaks into a unit, the police are duty bound to throw this person out based on the. Uh, the statement of the owner. However, they did put some teeth in it that if in fact it turns out that the person in possession was in legitimate possession, then the owner can get heavily sued with attorney's fees, et cetera. And, and I'm all for that. 
So we don't want landlords using trickery to get out a person who has legitimate possessory interest. But God knows if somebody breaks into a vacant house or maybe you're on vacation for a week and somebody all of a sudden starts to move in and you're sitting there without your house and having to go through an eviction, that's just absurd. So the politicians have to wake up and create some new laws. In fact, I tweeted today on that and my tweet was that maybe what we need to do is break into some of these politician homes and take up <laughs> occupancy. And maybe at that point, they would finally see the point of creating some proper laws. All right, my, I guess what my question is, what are your suggestions to uh, prevent squatters? Well, there's something that you can do. We were talking about in the last couple of shows where you give a statement to the police department that this is my property. And, uh, um, and if there is a trespasser there, I've made this affidavit to you. Uh, and if, and by the fact that I'm filing this affidavit with the local police department, you have to go out there and arrest these people. But nobody's really going to know to do that. The other thing that you can do is uh, make sure that your house is locked up. I would make it locked up with an alarm. And I would also have not only just a regular alarm, I'd have armed response. So this way, uh, when the, the company comes out relatively quickly, much quicker than the police will, of course, uh, they'll stop them from actually moving in. Okay. Good. All, All right, right, kids, we are going to move on. I am moving on. How's my time? We're doing pretty good here today. Let's move on to Joan Martinez. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself, please. Hey, Dennis. Hello, Joan. Hi. I served a UD on the tenants just for back rent from December. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, they came back with a response of BASTA representation and they want to go to trial. What do you know? What do I need to be aware of about BASTA? Well, number one, are you doing this without an attorney? No. Okay. So uh, BASTA is adept at finding the procedural errors in your lawsuit. Uh, I don't believe that they're very good attorneys, but they are adept at finding procedural errors. So hopefully your attorney knew everything that uh, they had to do, uh, because otherwise uh, they'll wipe the floor with you. They're going to ask for a jury trial, as you know, uh, and uh, and they're going to come to you with a settlement where even though the tenant owes you a few months worth of rent, they're going to ask you to waive that rent, pay them $20,000 and let the tenant stay for another 90 days. So, of course, we encourage our clients not to um, give in to these demands. And also, the Boston knows that we're not uh, making any procedural errors on our cases. Got it. Um, what's the success rate with defeating Boston cases? Uh, I can tell you that we win about 90% of all jury cases, including the ones that we go through with Boston. 90%. Okay, good to know. I'm just trying to get ahead of the game so I know what to expect. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, good luck to you, Joan. We're going to move over now to Lynette. Lynette, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Uh, good afternoon. Good um, afternoon. Question. Um, went for an eviction, got it. Um, it was sealed. So how do I let the next landlord know that there's an eviction on their hands? Because I well, wanted the person out, so I agreed to it, but then I'm you, screwing the if, next person. Well, if you agree to it, then that's what you agreed to. And right, you gotta, right. You got to stick to your agreement. No, so I am, like, but is there a way of notif you know? No, I would think you could get sued. You've agreed for the record to be sealed, so now you're going to stand up on Mount Sinai <laughs> with a big sign saying this guy got evicted. Uh, I, I think that's just going to open you up to a lawsuit. Next no, time, no, no, but I'm just saying, is there... Um, places that you can report legally you, you know that you can certainly report it legally any place you like but the problem is you've agreed to seal the record so they can okay. come back and say that you're in violation of that you cost me all this damages and i'm going to sue you lynette okay so there's no other got well, it. you've agreed to it darling. i understand i understand it was just to, <laughs> okay. to, you know it's just helping out the next person I understand you want to help out the next person, but you shouldn't have agreed to it. Well, then he wouldn't have moved. Okay. Well, then, you know, yeah. in, in life, there are tough choices. 
Yeah, you know, no, I'm okay. I'm okay clunk. with. I'm I'm perfectly okay with what I did. <laughs> okay, love you. All right. All right. Let's move on to, uh, uh but now Diva Award, Diva Award. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. It's good, yeah. Hi, right, Dennis. Thank you for what you do. I've You're known you for welcome. years. I've been going to the, your seminars for years. But I have one really quick question. Um, the question is in um state of California, um, San Diego County, City of Escondido. Um, I have a tenant, I'm planning on selling the property. I have a tenant that's lived there for over 20 years. And he is six over sixty-two. Do I have to pay a relocation? Um, I'm not see? familiar with Escondido whether they have a local rent control. I don't think they do. This is a single-family residence. It's no, it's a duplex. So, yeah. Okay, so you're going to be under assuming Escondido doesn't have rent control, which I don't think it does. But no. then you're under statewide rent control. Uh, you don't live in one of the duplexes, do you? No. Yes. No. No. Okay, so you, you're going to have to have a reason to evict. A reason is not I'm selling the property. Okay. The only thing that you could do, uh, assuming the tenant isn't doing anything wrong, like having extra people, pets, uh, not paying the rent, or made alterations to the premises. But the other thing that you could do is you could ask the tenants to move on the basis that you want to substantially renovate the premises. To that definition of that is that you're going to do work which will render the premises uninhabitable for at least 30 days and requires that the work that you're going to be doing requires a that you obtain a building permit. So what you would do, like if you're going to like, hey, you know what, before I sell the place, I think I'd rather get you out. I'll renovate the kitchen or the bathroom or both. I'll get a contractor who will give me, quote, the scope of the work showing how it will be uninhabitable for 30 days. You'll pull the permits and then you'll be able to serve on your tenant a notice uh, to vacate on the basis that you're going to renovate the unit. You do have to pay that tenant relocation money and the relocation money is one month's rent. Okay. And if I don't go down that route... Then you're selling the property with them because you have no other basis of getting them out unless you're going to do a cash for keys situation. Right. And cash for key would be about how much? Cash for keys, it ranges from $1 to $300 million. It's whatever the, <laughs> it's whatever the two of you agree on. It could be a ticket to Disneyland. Got it. Okay. Got it. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, let's move on to Frederick. Frederick Schulen, say hello and unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Dennis. Amazing. First time here. I really appreciate it. Um, Dennis, uh, my wife and I and two kids living in a single family home here in Los Angeles. Uh, we had a garage that we converted unlawfully. It's not a permitted unit. Converted into a little guest thing. Ended up renting it out to somebody. Um, that we were good friends with for for a long time. Um, now we have been trying to get her out um, because we need to, yeah, we want to get her out. She's been here now for six years. Um, she doesn't want to talk to us about getting out. Long story short, um, how much should we offer her to relocate approximately? What, what would be fair? What would be reasonable considering that she'll probably sue us for renting out the unit for five years and unlawfully. Um, and um, yeah, let's start with that. What, what would be fair? Is it six months notice and $30,000 or what What are we talking about here? Is um, she over 62? No. Does she have children? No. Uh, under the rules, you would have to pay her $12,950. That's so what... You can settle with her on any amount from $1 to, as I said, $300 million. <clears throat> However, what needs to happen is you need to call Building and Safety, get them to come down and give you something called an order to comply that you're a bad landlord and you rented out someplace that you shouldn't have. By the way, it is not that difficult to make that unit into a legal unit. So once you get this tenant out, you're going to get yourself a contractor. I don't have any recommendations, uh, but get yourself a contractor that will 
make this unit legal under state law. They have to allow you to do that. So now you don't have to be having this kind of a conversation. If you can't get a degree uh, on a figure, then what you need to do is we need to file an application process with the city. I need to have that order to comply in my hands from building and safety. Once we do that, we'll then uh, file the proper paperwork with the city. And then we're allowed to serve her with a 60 day notice and pay her the relocation money, which is $12,950. And in case you're curious, I'm not that smart. I have my cheat notes to the right of me. <laughs> Great. Um, okay. Should we expect a law, a, 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 some sort of lawsuit after that for? Well, sometimes they threaten you that they're going to want to get all the rent that they paid back. But that's a baseless threat. There's nothing in the law that states that you have to return the rent. They got value for the property. They had a they had a a home which had heat, had locking windows, had cold and hot running water. So they got value for it, even though it was an illegal unit. Great. Thank you, Dennis. I'll come back to you as soon as I have the, the eviction notice from the city, I guess, or the... Well, you need the... to go to building and safety and turn yourself in and get that, that wonderful paper called an order to comply. Then we can apply to the city for you. Sorry, you dropped out right there when you said, well, what was the name of the paperwork? You're going to call building and safety and you're going to get them to issue you an order to comply because you are leasing out an unpermitted unit. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, I think I think I got rid of you. Sorry about that. Okay, moving along to, and we still got time here. Harold, say hello. Hey, Dennis. Dennis, Look have you heard? You. Have you heard the uh, what the definition of justice is? Tell me. It's just us. <laughs> well, I'll give you one. <laughs> What's the difference between unlawful and illegal? There is no difference. Well, no, unlaw that's not true. Unlawful is against the law and illegal is a sick bird. A fixed bird? A sick bird. Oh, okay. Sick bird. Okay. Illegal. Okay. Move on with your question. Okay. So basically, I'm going to quandary owner occupied LA just cause. I just raised the rent starting April 1st. But then, and and in the back of my mind, like say six, nine months from now, I wanted to raise it again since I'm allowed to. Uh, and at that second time, I want to raise it so that it's market rate, so that incentivize the tenant to leave, okay? Then I just found out that this, there's a new state law that if you raise the rent more than once, you have to pay a big chunk of relocation fee. So now it's like they're kind of, I don't I'm know. sorry, what place. city is this? It's in uh, Los Angeles. Okay, Where so in Los Angeles, they have something called the economic displacement that if in fact uh, you raise the rent uh, more than 10% in any one year, that the tenant can elect to move and ask for relocation. And relocation, this is an apartment, it's not a house, correct? No, no it is a house. It's an owner-occupied okay. landlord. Okay, so then yeah. if, it's, if it's a house, then it's only one month's rent. So it's not a big deal. But what I'm saying is, is the other the the main strategy was to raise it so high that he wants to leave. Exactly. Okay. So, so you do right, that, but, but, and then if he chooses to leave, he would if he knows and be entitled to relocation. But the relocation is one month's rent. No, I get it. But what I'm saying is the state law says you can't raise the rent more than once in a 12 month period. The state the, law. The does new not state apply. law. The new okay. state law. The old state law. The upside down law. State does not prevents you from raising the rent as much as you like, whenever you like. And okay, so then I'm just stuck. I'm I'm comfortable with the LA version, not the state version. Doesn't over. matter. You can raise the rent to whatever you like, young sir. Okay, thank you. Now I can sleep. sleep Go Lakers. young sir. Okay, we are going to move on to Elizabeth Heron, who's been very patient, I might add. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello, how are you? I am fine, thank you. Oh, good. Um, a couple of questions um, on eviction. Can you do a no fault in Ventura County so your family member could move in? Okay, uh, absolutely. Uh, is this an apartment or a house? A house. Is there only one house on the lot? Yes. When did the tenant move in? Five years ago. Okay, so all you need to do is serve a 60 day notice. I would suggest having my law firm serve it for you, but uh, you don't need to pay any relocation. There is no protection for this tenant. 
Okay. Um, how frequently can you increase the rent on your tenant in Ventura County? Single family home? One is a single family, one is a town home. Okay, in both cases, regardless of what city you are in the state of California, you can raise the rent as much as you like, whenever you like. They are exempt from rent control under a beautiful law called Costa Hawkins. Are you still there? I am still here. And then the deposits on a new tenant into a property, uh, is it if you have four or less income properties that you do a one month? What is the exact rule on accepting deposits? Okay, well, deposits? the law right now says you can get two months security for an unfurnished unit across the state of California. Come July, it's only going to be one month security deposit plus the first month's rent. The exception would be if you own uh, in and if you own uh, four units in a maximum of two buildings, then you're entitled to a two month security. But if you have like an eight unit building, you're dead. You can only get a one month security. So four units or less, two months over that is one month. You got it. Thank you very much. Okay, we're coming to the end, but I'm going to pick on Jamika McNeil. Say hello. Hi. Hi, Dennis. How are you? Thank you for this forum. No problem. I have a question. I believe I have my partner on the line. Her name is Angela Johnson. Um, she purchased a property in June of 2022, um, inherited Section 8 tenants. Recently, we've been made aware of an incident that took place with a resident walking by where a tenant's dog bit them. We went back, looked at old leases from 2010, and it said no pets. We're wanting to utilize this opportunity to evict the tenant. Is that possible? One. I, I think so. Uh, the fact that um, the rental agreement prohibits pets, the fact that we now know that this is a dangerous animal, I think we can do that. Okay. And I just want to be clear, we, we inherited the leases. It's the leases with the old owner, not us. Well, that's not exactly true. The lease is what they call in law school, which I went 50 years ago, uh, run with the land. That's the terminology. So you are allowed to, um, uh, that lease is your lease, like it or not. So gotcha. you're allowed to enforce that lease. And we can hire you to help us with that eviction process. Is that right? I am a lawyer for hire. <laughs> anyway, I thank you very much. I am going to call it an end. I, we had a lot of people in the room. Don't forget, I'm going to be putting this up on uh, YouTube uh, afterwards. I'll probably get to it in, within an hour or two and get it up. So if you go to my channel, uh, and uh, which is uh, youtube.com slash evict123, You'll see it, or you can meander over to my website, evict123.com, and that'll lead you right into it. I want to thank everybody for participating in this forum. Uh, next week, I'm still intending to do this, even though there's uh, uh, a Laker game uh, at around noontime, so I might cancel. So check your local listings to see whether I'm going to be doing this next week. But anyway, I want to thank everybody, and you guys have a great, great weekend. Stay dry.